just moving that line of separation there. So if I go in house A, I change and put house A's shoes on. When I leave, I change into different shoes, go over to house B, I change shoes, go into house B. Those shoes dedicated to that house, never leaving is, is a simple way to do it. If you're a service tech, double boot. So I, I boot when I when I get out of the car, I put an extra boot on. When I go through house A, I come out, I take those off, throw them away, I walk to house B, I put another hot fire on. It, it sounds like a pain in the butt, it kind of is, but it's one of the simplest and most effective things we can do. Hello and welcome. I'm Kate Malash, your host for this episode of the Poultry Podcast Show. Joining us today is our guest, Dr. Jonathan Moyle. Dr. Moyle grew up on a family farm in Idaho, completed his bachelor's degree at Brigham Young University, follows, followed by his master's and PhD in reproductive physiology at the University of Arkansas. Dr. Moyle is currently an extension specialist at the University of Maryland, where his programs provide Maryland's poultry industry and small poultry growers with general practical knowledge about poultry production practices with the overall goal of developing, maintaining, and operating economically viable and environmentally responsible poultry operations, both within the state and throughout the Delmarva region. His current and future research includes helping growers find alternatives for bedding, improving nutrient management, and helping commercial and small flock owners improve their biosecurity. Welcome, Dr. Moyle. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, appreciate it. Glad you invited me. Thank you so much for being here. How are you doing? Oh, actually, it's a sunny day out, as you can probably tell from the background, which is kind of rare for this time of year, thinking yes. it's supposed to push 70. I don't even know why I'm inside. I should have called in sick. <laughs> well, we're very glad that you made the choice to come on the podcast today. I'll try not to keep you from enjoying that rare spring weather in February up in Delmarva. That's right. But, uh, nah, you're good. No worries. <laughs> Before we really get started, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your background. Can you tell us the story of how you came all the way from Idaho to be a extension professor at University of Maryland? It's an interesting question. So um, I actually grew up on a mink farm. Uh, we raised mink out in Idaho and, and that's kind of my background. So I have a long history with the anti-animal movement. So it's kind of a, not a love, love relationship there. But anyway, I grew up on a mink farm, but we always had chicken. We always had a small flock. We've had a small flock my whole life. Uh, but we also, because I grew up on a mink farm, we worked closely with a lot of the egg industry because we would get their coal eggs to use as mink food. And we would also help depopulate and use their spent ends as mink food. So because of that, I, I, I spent a lot of time working with them. And, and oddly enough, I am allergic to fur. So it was kind of a miserable life for me growing up working on a mink farm. So when the opportunity came, I went to college and I, I got a chance to work with poultry. I already had some background work with layers, so I just kind of jumped into it. Kind of went that way, and and then after you know my first job out of college, I managed a turkey farm, and then actually quit for a while, went and managed a pet food company, and then I bought a breeder, breeder farm in Arkansas. So I had a breeder farm for a few years until a tornado come through, at which point I did go back to University of Ar or Arkansas, like you, you mentioned earlier, and got my master's, my PhD. It was it was kind of interesting. I I got it with uh, Dr. Bramwell, who was a a couple of years ahead of me at BYU, we worked together on the poultry farm. So we, we knew some of those people. Dr. Dr. Dustin Clark was there as well. He was the state vet when I was at Arkansas, or well, associate state vet, and he was at Arkansas. So it was a lot of fun. So it was more of a get back together. And that's kind of how I got around to here. And then uh, Maryland offered me a job after I got my PhD. So that's where I'm at. Wow. It seems like kind of all signs were pointing to poultry for you from the, from the very beginning. Yeah. It, it, it was kind of interesting how, how things worked out. It wasn't where I thought I would be, but it's where I like to be. And, and extension is very different. You know, as you mentioned, I do extension work, which means I, I, I'm not on campus. Campus is two and a half hours away. I work at a research farm and, and my job is to work with growers and the companies. It's, and so it's very different. You know, yes, I do work with students from time to time, but not, that's not my main role. And I do have a research component as well. So we're looking at different things. But it's been a very good fit for me because I don't have to fit in that campus. You know, you had to fight for parking today. You know, my biggest choice on parking, you know, which of the 20 spots do I want to park in or do I just want to pull up and park on the grass under the tree? You know, just a very different lifestyle. And, and I kind of really like it. It sounds like you have better access probably than to, you know, some of the small flock growers, growers you're able to get, you know, out and about more easily that way. Absolutely. Uh, our poultry industry is, is centered here on the shore, on the eastern shore ground. If you look at, if you look at a map, you know, there's the bays in the middle and our college parks on one side and I'm on the other side. And, and our industry is out here. And by being here, you know, there's within what, 
within 70 miles of these 120 million chickens, broilers. So, you know, we, we have great access. The small flock is something I do work a lot with. I enjoy, I have a, one of our local county agents, she assists me in all that. And on the commercial side, I have another agent that works with me. She has a commercial farm and we work on that side together. So it's been very good, very good for us. Yeah, great position to be in. I mean, Delmarva is, you know, historically the birthplace of the poultry industry. So you've probably seen everything from houses built in, uh, well, maybe the 1950s. I'm not sure how many of those are still standing, but all the way up to modern tunnel ventilated houses. There are some. I drive by some of the old two-story 1950s. And in fact, I think the original one of uh, oh, Steele's house, the one that she started with, is in the museum up north of here. So you can actually find that. So you can go all the way back to the 20s if you really want to look hard. Wow. So for anyone in the audience who wants to do kind of a, a poultry industry history pilgrimage, the shore is the place to go to. Yeah, absolutely. You you will find everything. It's it's quite interesting. We still have birds being grown in some of the old houses. Um, I've been in some that are 30, 40 years old. They still produce great birds. If they've been maintained, they do a great job. That's true. That's true. A lot of it is just, you know, the, the knowledge and expertise of the grower really makes the flock. Oh, absolutely. If if your people, and it's, it's something, I'm a fan of all the new technology, but it's something that I dread because too many people think now I can look at a computer on my chicken farm. And mm -hmm. that is absolutely as far away as you can be. It is an asset to help you, but it does not replace the time that you actually spend inside chicken houses. I mean, I tell everybody, your best friend is a five-gallon bucket. Go in there, sit it down upside down when you're not busy. Just sit there and look, smell, feel. What's going on in your house? And and you'll learn more about your birds that way than, than many computers. Yes. I always like to say the birds will tell you. Yeah. If there's anything going wrong, if there's anything going right, the birds will tell you. You know, and some of the best growers I've ever known in my life were the ones that shunned all the technology. I mean, back before all this was starting, I mean, I knew a grower that, he's a breeder, but he used to always say he could get eggs from a duck. I mean, eggs from a rabbit, sorry. And I was saying that because the guy was good, but I tell you, if it was a bad day, you would see him down. He never left his chicken house. I mean, he would be down there. I mean, I've seen him on the hot day sitting in the shade of his, you know, of his uh, feed tank with a cooler sitting there with a lawn chair watching his birds. He wasn't going to leave them. And that kind of dedication really showed in the fact that he was one of the best I've ever seen. You, you never, you know, you never want to, he was always good. He always made us all look bad. <laughs> hey, those are the growers that you want to have and you want to keep. <laughs> yeah, I was glad I retired. I looked a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a really good point. You you can't fix a problem that you're not there to see. Right. And then again, and it's there's more to it than just looking at a computer screen. Granted, they're excellent, they're great data. It can be helpful, especially when you're trying to figure out problems. But again, just being in there is so important. Hmm. That's a good point. Good point. So when you're out working with either the industry or small flat growers, do you run into any kind of common misconceptions or pervasive kind of old school beliefs? Or honestly, it sounds like some new school beliefs that technology can substitute for supervision. But is there anything out there that you're seeing a lot of that you're kind of having to educate uh, specifically well, towards? I guess we could say right now is that I don't know if you pay attention to any of the social media. I kind of deleted all my accounts, but we still have one for work. But it's everybody's freaking out, but specifically in the in the small flocks right now. Oh, it's a conspiracy by the feed companies. My chickens aren't laying, yada, yada, yada. I'm sure you've seen it. We've all got these comments. And I've had... Oh, company A stinks. So now I'm buying from company B and I've got as many people saying company B stinks. Now I buy it by company A and guess what? It fixed my problem. Well, the problem was it was the time of year. And if they would pay attention, this happens every year. We go through this every year. You know, the winter time, birds are going to molt. And it's just a fact. They're going to go out of lay and they're going to come back in. And it's just really interesting to watch everybody, you know, and, and feed is way down the list. I mean, I had one grower call up because, well, I changed my feed. I said, well, what else happened? Well, I had a fox get in there. Okay, so now you've had a stressor. You had a feed that you have them on lights. Well, I have them on lights, but I've been on 24-hour lights for three straight years. Well, of course, the birds need a break. And so you can go down these lists and start raising, you know, there's all these other things it could be. And uh, actually, so right now, I guess that's kind of a pet. Yeah, for sure. I, I've been seeing that. I've been trying very hard to resist the urge to engage with it. But, but I know but, nothing good is going to come of that for me. Um, but it, it has been kind of interesting, particularly the ones who say they've switched feed, but actually they just switched brands within the same company without realizing it. That's that too. 
there is that. <laughs> yes. Um, another common one that I've seen is people posting about, you know, my flock stopped laying, I haven't been picking up any eggs. And then a, a week or so later, they'll post a photo of a giant clutch of eggs somewhere out in their yard or in their garage. And it turns out the birds have just found somewhere clever to build a nest. Or you have a snake. Yes. I've, or I, too. I, I've got I've got photos of that. Now I can't. <laughs> Yes. Now that's a very good example of how sometimes things kind of get carried away on social media. And, and I think that's a, that's an important role that we need to play as universities and extension. I, I think that we spend too much time avoiding getting into those. Like you mentioned, you're trying to avoid getting into it. Now we, we try and just put links to important things. So join in and just say, well, here's an interesting article to talk about this or, or, or kind of not trying to jump in, but kind of mediate it into a way that it looks more towards what's logical. I don't know. Oh, without without trying to be, uh, I don't want to say I don't want to be a bully. You don't want to be a preacher, but you just kind of want to be somebody that can I direct them in a way. Mm -hmm. That's true. I, I try to avoid engaging on like an individual to individual basis, but I could see where you know just providing a link to a bulletin or a newsletter from a reputable source, like an extension uh, department, would be very helpful. Yeah, and and. You know, that's one of the things we do a lot of work with our website, and we used to have such a great website. I mean, we'd get 50,000 hits a year, and they changed, the university decided to change their whole thing. So now we got a UNLR, so we got to start all over. So I got it back up to about 30,000, and then last year they decided to change again. So it's like, it's not a, but you know, we still average, you know, about 1,100 visits a month, 11, 1,200 visits, you know, and, and during the AI outbreak, we really had a lot. Our social media was so important during our AI outbreak last year, last February and March. We, you know, during that time, you know, we were getting 14,000 visits, you know, during those three months that we had that, just people going on there to find out what's going on. So we don't want to poo-poo social media, but we need to keep it in a good way. The bad thing about it, though, was, sadly enough, our site got shut down as a suspicious organization by Facebook. Oh, like, no. Like, <laughs> university, it says it right here. Here's all our credentials. And so after like four months, they shut us down. So we had to start another one. Oh, no. Oh, that's so frustrating. It's like, how the hell are we suspicious? Yeah, that is very frustrating, especially because it takes people forever to find you again. Right. And then that's exactly what happens. So sometimes I wonder if I should have kept my own stuff and just kept everything there rather than try and use university resources. Yes. <laughs> anyway, it is what it is. Yeah. And um, we're really glad that you're, you guys are making an effort to reach out and put good information out there. It's desperately needed. Yeah. So yeah, we have our, like I said, our website, Maryland Poultry. Uh, it's all right. Just Google us. It's the easiest way to find it. You know, just Maryland Extension Poultry will find us. We keep it. And on there, we keep all our, our list of all our upcoming events. We keep our newsletters or our past events. We like, for example, we do what we call a grower lunch breaks where we have a, an hour meeting and companies sponsor them, but we, we talk about different things and they get a lunch. And we'll, we've actually been recording those lately. We're putting those recordings up so people that can't make it can actually go back and watch those recordings. So it's an easy way for us to bring out um, important information. For example, we just uh, did one where we're doing it on drones and trespass laws because we're seeing a lot more drones being flown over farms. We're having some issues with people coming on farms. What is your legal, you know, what are you legally entitled to do? What are your responsibilities? What can the police do? And it's a very important conversation to have. And so those are kind of the topics we look for. You know, we talk about, I think our next one's on gut health, and then we're going to do some litter management ones. So it's just topics like that that we're always trying to get out there ahead of and keep our growers actively engaged so that they can look at what's new and what's coming. That's a great idea. I hadn't even thought about the drone issue. I know those have been, you know, problematic for things like national parks, just general trespassing. But honestly, it hadn't occurred to me that people are flying them over farms. We, we actually have a lot of that out here where, where organizations are flying them, trying to find farms that are out of compliance with environmental rules, or they're looking for anything they can do to come after farmers. Our farmers are doing a great job. So, you know, you haven't seen anything. So that, that shows one thing. In fact, they're doing it. We haven't seen anything. It means our farmers are doing good. Are they perfect? Heck no. We, we all have problems. We all make mistakes, but they're getting so much better. And it's, it's, exciting, to, it's exciting to see how much effort is being put on them, but we're not hearing it. <laughs> so, you know, knowing the Delmarva poultry growers that I know, I would expect that maybe their uh, their response to a drone over the land might to be to go grab their their usual, you know, coyote deterrent. That's right. Shooting a drone is a bad thing. It's a no, no. Do not do that. 
<laughs> so what what should they do? I don't want to spoil your grow roll. Actually, uh, there there are a few things you can do. Basically, if they if you can find out who's doing it, have a talk with them, report them. Because you, while the police can't do anything, this goes with trespassers too. They're not going to do anything if somebody trespasses the first time. However, if they do come back and do it another time or two, then it becomes a harassment issue, at which point the police can take issue. But honestly, for a simple trespasser, there's really nothing they can do. So you have to actually document, report, so that if it happens again, then it takes it to the next level of a harassment, at which point they can do something. That's good to know. How about you know securing your facilities or how to make sure that your facilities are in compliance as viewed from the air. Obviously, they should be in compliance all the time, but are there specific things they're looking for with the drugs? Well, see, one of the things we have here is they're looking for manure outside the production area or, you know, manure around the farm is what they're really looking for. But again, at this time of year, our farmers are doing a great job. This time of year, we're getting staging manure in fields because, you know, March 1st, we can start spreading manure. So things are moving. Uh, but as far as securing, I think you, you said something that's very important. We do need to secure our farms. And one of the best things you can do is just a camera. I have a lot of my farmers that I visit. I mean, when I pull on the farm, my picture's taken and they know I'm there. And, and you know, so I always wave because, you know, you want to make sure you're But they want to know who's coming on your farm. That's such an important thing to do, if you have, especially if you have multiple entrances. How can you watch all of them? How can you monitor what's going on? I'm a huge fan of gates, but companies don't like gates because then they're, they're Feed truck drivers have to get out, open a gate, yada, yada, yada. I get that. But, you know, it does keep people back. And make sure, too, that you have signage up. I mean, you can't say anybody's trespassing if you don't have a sign up that says no trespassing. So make sure that things are marked according to your local rules and regulations. Monitor who comes on and off because we do have people that occasionally just pull on an arm and get out and start trying to walk into buildings. Are your doors locked on your buildings? It's another important thing to keep in touch with. And do not enter signs on those is important, or biosecurity signs at least, because most biosecurity signs say stop, like the ones we give out. I'm gonna have to picture one here, but you know they say stop, no in, no admittance without permission, and there's a phone number. Well, that there's that's a no trespassing sign, so that counts. And we actually had the legal team of Maryland look at that before we put those out to show that this is something that's that's readily available. We we've got them across all of Del Mar. That's great advice, uh, not only from a physical security standpoint, but also, as you mentioned, biosecurity. I imagine this is not your your f- first go around with an avian influenza outbreak. Um, could you talk a little bit about your experience and, you know, it, was it the same or different? Last year was. Yeah, well, I was in Arkansas. We had low path. I mean, so my first high path was, was here last year. Uh, the time before that was before I came out here. So I, that was my first one here. It was very interesting. I, I think that our, our broiler industry was very well prepared and they were ready to go. Our layer industry, not so much. That's where I think we struggled a little more. But again, if you've looked overall, the layer industry has been hit a lot harder than our broiler industry. So there may be some more to it. I don't understand all that. It was, it was a very educational. In fact, I spent all day yesterday in a USDA training a webinar about how to be a site manager and how to be a case manager because I, I got thrown into that. I, I came, actually, I just got back in the country. I'd been working with the university in Africa. We're working with a university over there and I got back and the next day I got a phone call from the assistant state vet and said, hey, can you come up here? I got up there and they handed me an address and said, go secure the site. I've never been on one of these before. What do I do? It was a great, it was a great experience, learning experience, and uh, I hope I never have it again. <laughs> we all hope to not have it again. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be going away. No, and I, I, I have, I, I'm curious to see what we do as an industry going forward. I have my feelings and thoughts of what we should do. We'll see what what happens. But it was, it was very interesting. I think it was really good. And the thing I'm very proud of is we worked so much with our growers. We only had two cases in our broiler farms here, and both of those were found through testing prior to slaughter. Uh, I'm not sure about the second. I know the first one was. I'm not sure on the second. I'm going to hold off on that. But again, to think of the density we hear, we have the highest density of anywhere in the world of broiler farms. And the fact that it only hit two, it shows you that our growers are are listening. They're paying attention. They're trying to practice. Can we do it better? Yes, absolutely. Um, and the one comment I heard the other day is someone says, we preach biosecurity all the time. And that's great, but do we live it? I mean, there's a difference between preaching something and living something. I think I think our growers are doing a much better job. Are there any kind of key areas for biosecurity that stand out in your mind that have room for improvement? Well, you know, the thing I would say is every farm needs to have their line of separation at the door to their houses. 
and I'm, I'm, I mean that it's, if you have room for the Danish entry system in your, ser- in your service room, put it in. Uh, we have a lot of old farms that don't even have service rooms. We have to figure something else out but where that line of separation is actually going in and out of that chicken house. We change the dynamic because trying to disinfect all the trucks coming on and off the farm is very difficult. We're not going to get hundred percent effective. We've got birds that fly over. You're not going to bring any of that material from outside inside if that line of separation is there. Should we continue to monitor who comes on and off? Absolutely. Do we need to move our garbage dumpsters to the front of the farm so the garbage truck's not driving through our farm? Absolutely. But just moving that line of separation there. So if I go in house A, I change and put house A's shoes on. When I leave, I change into different shoes, go over to house B, I change shoes, go into house B. Those shoes dedicated to that house, never leaving is, is a simple way to do it. If you're a service tech, double boot. So I, I boot when I when I get out of the car, I put an extra boot on. When I go through house A, I come out, I take those off, throw them away. I walk to house B, I put another hot fire on. It, it sounds like a pain in the butt, it kind of is, but it's one of the simplest and most effective things we can do. Yes, agreed. I've been really happy to see the increase in dedicated footwear and, and double boot practices. It is a pain in the butt, but it's not as much of a pain in the butt as an AI outbreak So, or, or any other disease. <laughs> Why? And it doesn't, that's a great, I was just going to say that. It doesn't stop the AI. We've seen a drop in, in LT. We've seen a drop in other diseases as well. But one thing we always need to disinfect is this dadgum thing here. How was the last time you disinfected your phone? You carry that bad boy with you in every house. You carry it everywhere. You're constantly touching it. When was the last time you took the case off and cleaned it? Yeah. Just simple things like that are so important. Thank you so much for saying that. You know, I, I think about that a lot as, as you're visiting farms and, Everyone has their phone out on one farm, using it as a flashlight, taking photos of things for their notes. You know, it, it's not just the growers, it's the block supervisors, vets, nutritionists. It's all of us. <laughs> it's all of us have that phone out a lot. Because it's, it's, it's become an appendage and that's fine. Yeah. But we have to realize while we're washing our hands and our, cleaning our shoes, we also need to remember to do those as well. It's great advice. Those are my pet peeves. Sorry. No, oh, hey, that's a pet peeve of mine as well. I'm glad you brought it up. And I'm anti foot bath. I will tell you that right off the beginning. I, and and people always say, well, shoes are expensive, but when you figure the cost and time involved in trying to keep a foot bath up, you <laughs> should buy an extra pair of shoes and leave in the house. Foot baths are pretty easy to walk around, and <laughs> we're not always effective. When was the last time it was cleaned? I can show you pictures of some of the dirtiest dead gum foot baths you've ever seen, and. What good did it do? I, I'd actually more afraid to put my feet in there than I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Good point. I would love to see more of the Danish entry style. Right. And we're seeing that a lot more on our newer construction. And some of the people that are retrofitting uh, service rooms and stuff are making them extra large so you could put those in. So mm-hmm. we are seeing a big increase in. Well, and it makes it easier and more convenient to change footwear or to double boot because you, you get to sit down. So <laughs> Right. Well, and you could take a normal service room and do that. Just put a two by six across there, or two by 12 across there in the middle of it, you know, and one side's clean, one side's dirty and make it simple. I mean, it doesn't have to be complicated. Yeah, that's a good point. How about uh, for small flock growers? Particularly, I'm curious what your advice is for biosecurity uh, with pasture raised or birds with outdoor access. That seems like a really challenging place to have biosecurity. It really is. Right now, like I tell all the small flock growers, there's nothing growing. There's no bugs. Why let them loose? I mean, we can keep them locked up at this time of year. And this is the most important time as we have the flyaways and we still got the geese. I was seeing the swans this morning, so we still have the waterfowl here. Once they start leaving and things warm up, yes, people are going to let them out more. I don't know how we're going to get around that. Uh, Other than we just, we work a lot with them, keeping vigilant and or let them Limit the time they're out. If you're in an area where there's waterfowl, don't do it at all. If you're in an area where there's no waterfowl, maybe you could let them out for a few minutes in the afternoon. But it's more about educating them about the disease and, and what to look for and, and hoping they'll do the right. It's mm, a good point. I'm wondering for the people who are hesitant to kind of keep their birds inside or inside a run, are there investments they can make either to their run or enrichments for those birds that might make them feel more comfortable about not necessarily pasturing them? Well, your run is a simple way to do it. Just put a roof over it. So yeah, it turns into a porch, but you know, they'll still have those, that net around the outside. They can get that sunshine you're looking for, that fresh air. And and we all know there's no plants growing in our runs anyway. Let's be yes. honest. You let chickens out, they do, they do new to all the population. So what the heck? So I, I think that's just a simple way to do it. I, I think my daughter's done that in the past. 
I mean, that's how she kept hers. You know, when she let them outside, she had a covered run so that they could get that outdoor exercise. They get the air, the sun, but at the same time, you're not, you're, you're limiting the exposure to any potential. You're not eliminating it. You're just lowering. So going back to our conversation about social media, one thing I have seen fairly frequently is people thinking it's a great idea to allow wild turkeys to come up to their run and interact with their birds. It's the cutest thing. It's spreading like wildfire on social media. So adorable. Uh, I, I <laughs> have, yeah, I, let's be honest. I have not seen that one. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, my, my best one was a lady called me the other day and said, I let my chickens eat the bird seed out of the bird feeder. Is, do I need to worry about that? I'm like, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, if you have chickens, you probably shouldn't have a bird feeder anywhere near them. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's kind of what I was trying to do. But but that's, I mean, those are great points to educate on them because they may not necessarily, especially because they hear so much about diseases spreading in the commercial populations or just specifically with waterfowl. I don't think they think about the turkeys, uh, the regular bird feeder visitors, et cetera. And again, it doesn't have to be just AI. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got your bronchitis, you've got an, an external parasites. I mean, let's yes. be honest. If I'm letting my birds out where, where house sparrows or starlings are going, I'm worried about parasites more than anything. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot of benefits to keeping things separate. That's good. Good education for, for small flock areas. You know, it's not... I know we tend to kind of assume that they're doing things, you know, they're... We assume that they're not making their best efforts to prevent the spread of diseases, but honestly, it's just they haven't been educated about it or the education they've gotten has been from resources that are not necessarily the best information. Or they have a different view on life. Yes. And then that's the, yeah, that's the one thing is, is their view of animals is different than ours. So how do we work with them in a way that, that will help them? And so you have to kind of try and look at it from their point of view. But there's a lot of them out there. Just for example, in Maryland, we have, I think it's 600, almost 700 commercial farms. We have, so we're supposed to, our small flocks are supposed to register, which I really don't think they do because I can look at a map and tell you these guys aren't registered, but that's not my place. But we have over 1,200 registered, 12,000 registered. So not 12,000, 5,000. 5,000 registered small flocks versus 600 commercial. And we know that's not all of them. So we're looking at a larger number and so it's important to work with them. And, and particularly in this avian influenza outbreak, we're seeing much more AI in the small flocks. Uh, and I, I think part of that is I think they're doing a better job of reporting it this time. I think it was probably a little bit there last time. We just missed it or they, you know, because I, I know people that are always going to, you know, my birds are getting sick. I'm, I'm worried. I'm just going to depopulate, bury and shut up, not say anything. I know that happens. I'm not, I'm not going to deny it. But at the same time, I think people are doing a better job of letting know what's going on and try to be educated. Yeah, it's. Uh, I would suspect that the population of small flock owners is only going to grow over the next year, given the you know high egg prices and again this uh, proliferation of news articles about small flock owners. That's only going to raise awareness and 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 you nailed something when when the when the COVID hit. We we you know we've always done some small flock work where we'll go to the local feed stores and we'll do talks every spring. In fact, we've got a couple lined up again where we go and talk to people. Well, working with my, my county agent next door, uh, Megan Purdue, we decided to take it and put it online during COVID. So we started our whole backyard farming. We started off with backyard flocks, then we added goats and sheep. So we ended up making it farming. But again, that's something we're still doing and we're still seeing quite a quite a bunch of people join in. But one of the reasons we did that was during the, uh, that pandemic, you saw such a huge increase of people buying chicks. If you remember, there was a chick shortage. You couldn't buy this, you couldn't buy that. And it's still going on. So it, it's a it's a whole demographic that we really need to work on, and I, I think as universities, and it's extension to large point, we we worry about the big commercial, but what have we really done to focus on the small flock with the education, the outreach? I mean, there's some individuals that are doing a fantastic job. I mean, as a whole, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. No, I I agree. I would love to get to the point where you know a small flock owner, if they are say related to a grower for a commercial operation, when they have that grower over for dinner or for a birthday party, they can say, hey, I own chickens. Maybe you should reconsider. Maybe you shouldn't go out there and touch them. I would love to have the small flock people thinking about, hey, we have to protect the industry people. We have to, you know, we're, we have a stake in this. 
because it, it goes both ways. We need them to be it help, and it, and exactly. It needs to go. You said the important thing. It needs to go both ways. We're yeah. they're never going to go away, and I don't want them to go away. No. Let's be honest. There's some beautiful birds out there, but we don't have them in industry. It's pretty bland and boring. When you really want to see some exciting birds, go go to a chicken show and see what they have. Put mm-hmm. in a practice biosecurity security, we get home, shower shit, you know. But again, there's so much things out there, genetic potential. I mean, to me, that's what's always fascinated me. More of the, I say this, I, the more of the small flocks, more fun, just because of the ver- diversity, the variety. Mm-hmm. I also think, you know, with fewer and fewer people in the U.S. growing up on a farm, I think that might be our future population of poultry scientists are are these kids who are growing up in homes with small flocks. It's definitely going to make them more interested in chickens than never seeing a chicken in their life. Absolutely. And and the thing that's great about it, too, is chickens are a great life life learner. Mm-hmm. I mean, for kids. I mean, it teaches you responsibility. You have to take care of those animals. They're dependent upon you. It teaches you about death. Everything does always live. And, and it, it helps them to overlearn grief and how to deal with those things. And it, it teaches that, like I said, responsibility, that, and also food is where food comes from. Like you said, it's so important. And gardening, the same thing. We don't see gardening like we used to. I just, all these things I would love to see come back. So I think makes people more, I say this, more in touch with reality. Mm-hmm. My biggest complaint here is I deal with people across the bay that that live in an environmentally controlled house, that get in their environmentally controlled car to drive their environmentally controlled office where they spend their day, then they stop at the environmentally controlled gym to work out before going home. And then when they want to go commute with nature, they go to a park, which is manicured. Mm-hmm. Mother nature's cruel. You're not seeing mother nature anywhere in that whole picture. Yes. Um my commercial farm was in, in rural Arkansas. I, we had problems with bears. We had problems with coyotes. We had problems with, you know, raccoons, possums, you name it. Because there was, you know, a couple thousand acres of woods right next to me. I mean, it was actually tens of thousands of forests just across the street. Mother Nature's not nice. Mm-hmm. And and today's world, kids are not learning that. And, I, I you know, other problem I see with society today is kids don't understand death. People, I mean, when I grew up, I'm, I remember my... My relatives, older relatives passed away. Oh, you saw these things. You dealt with it. Nowadays, everything's sanitized and, and removed, but having a poultry farm or even a garden where things don't make it, they die, teaches you how to deal with grief and how to overcome obstacles. Mm-hmm. It is a lesson that everyone has to learn at some point. And honestly, I do think that it is easier to learn at an earlier age. I do too. I Absolutely. It, I think it also is a huge opportunity for children to practice problem solving skills because you are always going to have problems with crops or with chickens and to have a mindset of investigation. You know, what are we going to do? Here's the problem. I absolutely, you're on to it. Good job. I, hey, I mean, that's what got me into poultry in the first place is I love the problem solving aspect of it. So I, I can see some benefits to having all these small flocks around. Right. Absolutely. By the way, if that last rant was wrong, you no, I, I think it's great. I think it's great. Sorry. I think right. we'll just, the world's become too sanitized and it's not a pretty place. Yes. I have a five year old stepdaughter and I, I wish I could have chickens. I can't, obviously, for biosecurity reasons, but we're definitely planning a garden and some other little animal ventures to, to teach. I understand. Like, like I said, my dad has chickens. He's pushing 90. My brothers all have chickens. My son has chickens. My daughter had chickens. Now she's back at college. I mean, I'm looking at all this. I, I'd, I'd have them in a heartbeat. I just, one of the first things I've got a list of what I'm going to do when I retire. First thing is buy chickens. So. Yes. Agreed. I'm, I'm in the same boat with you. See, I thought you were going to ask me about the international part. Uh, I was getting around to it. <laughs> but um, before that, if I could ask you a couple questions about some of your research. Okay. Um, specifically, I know that bedding and litter material has become more costly and a little bit scarce in recent years, especially in Delmarva. Um, what sort of alternative litter materials are you seeing being tested for use in broilers? When I very first came here, uh, I worked with Bill Brown at the Delaware, and we we were looking at using switchgrasses, and I know other universities were using miscanthus. It's kind of the same thing. They're, they're both warm season tall grasses. And right now, we, we found that there was no difference at all in production. In fact, we found just wash. You couldn't tell. So we actually have had growers now. We had a company come in. We have several thousand acres of miscanthus now here on the shore. I was out looking at some of that last week, in fact. 
And what they're doing now is they're chopping it and using it as bedding. So it is actually one company is, is contracting with growers to grow it for bedding. And that's making it, because it's it's kind of costly to start. You have to start with all the rhizomes. You have to get it planted. You don't get really anything your first year. You get a little bit your second. It's not to your fourth or fifth year you really start hitting stride. But we're seeing that make a big difference. Again, that's one of the easy ones to do. The other thing I've worked with on, on litter is actually what to do with it when we're done. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have on Del Marva is what they call, well, but it is phosphorus. Because for years, we told the farmers, our university did, our government told the farmers, don't worry about phosphorus, apply your manure according to your nitrogen. Don't worry about phosphorus. Well, now the science has changed. Now we're saying, oh, you guys screwed up. You know, there's too much phosphorus in the soil and everybody's yelling at the farmers. And my big complaint is they did exactly what the government, the university told them to do. Don't be yelled at them. But we do have a logistics problem. And everybody says we have a manure problem. Do not have a manure problem. We don't have an excess. We have a logistics problem where I have too much here. I need it there. How can we logistically move it? But one of the things our state has done is it funds some alternative manure projects where we look at like pyrolysis. Oh gosh, what was that? Fluidized bed, airflow, you know, burning to try and generate electricity, heat houses, anaerobic digestion. We're looking at projects like that to have a secondary market for this poultry litter. So that's been stuff that we've been working on pretty much my whole career here. Uh, again, I, I, I think we're doing it wrong. I think we should look at ways to transport manure more effectively. Because honestly, I have growers, you know, hour, hour and a half north of me that are begging for it, but the cost effectiveness moving it isn't there yet. We need to find a way to be able to cost effectively move. Yes. Yeah. You have that little thing called the Chesapeake Bay in the way of a lot of, a lot of movement there. <laughs> and, and we do, and we have some of the most highly environmentally stringent rules of any, well, we do, we, of all the poultry growers in the nation, we, we have most, most strict rules. And again, we're able to live within those and we're getting better every year. Um, is every farmer perfect? No. Just like every guy that drives down the speed limit, a car, everybody drives on the highway, don't go to the speed limit. We do, we do a very good job. Our farmers are come a long way and they're going to continue to go more. Yeah. The shore was one of the first regions to see, uh, stricter environmental regulations for poultry farmers. I think we're seeing that across the U S now as sustainability becomes more and more important. Um, is there any advice you have as far as, um, you know, nutrient management, even before we get to litter, are there, you know, things you can do with the feed, uh, the management of the litter within the house, and then, of course, application of the litter afterwards? They're, they're, the company's already looking at that from a cost-effective way. You know, how is, we don't want to put too much nitrogen. Uh, lower the nitrogen. That nitrogen costs more than carbon when we were feeding animals. But we're also looking at a lot of the phytase use to lower the phosphorus levels. We're seeing that. They, there's been some fantastic research out there done. I think Rosalina Haniel has been really good on that showing some ways to uh, to keep those levels down. And in doing so, we're seeing less phosphorus go on the fields. But again, if, if you're in an old dairy area and, and industry or poultry's moved in, you're probably going to have those P levels there already because of the dairy industry or some of these others. So again, I think it's a lot of it is, is nutrient management planning is just such an important thing. If, if you're not doing it mandatorily, voluntarily do it to prevent yourself from being mandatory. I think a lot of these things that farmers are doing are so good, but when it's mandated is different than when you volunteer to do it. Does that make sense? If I'm voluntarily doing this, we have a problem. We can work around it. Where if it's mandated, we have a bigger problem. And we want it. We want to see things because as all farmers, nobody wants to be a polluter. No one wants to do a bad job. What's you know? It's like animal welfare. Oh, you know, but everybody's doing that already. We care about our animals. So it's the same with our, our, our nutrient management plan. We do care. Let's just make sure that we're seen doing it in a way and, and be proactive. Don't wait till it hits you. Get ahead of the ball. That is fantastic advice for companies around the U.S. to get ahead of this and really implement those strategies in the feed, either producing overall crude protein through the use of supplemental amino acids or putting a phytase in to reduce uh, phosphorus excretion. The more they can get ahead of it, the better. Uh, I totally agree. Thank you for that. No, that's that's another rant. Yeah, no, good good rant. Like I said, I, I, you look at our regulations for our farmers. I don't have them here, but it's binders. It's three or four binders just to grow chickens on the shore. I mean, it's you to actually manufacture guns and ammunition here with less regulation than grow corn, let alone chickens. So, 
you know, rather than let it be the regulation, do this stuff already. And then it doesn't come at you. Mm -hmm. It's a good point. Once it's in the soil, it's very hard to get it out, the soil and the water. So Yeah, and that's that's our problem with phosphorus. It took us a hundred years to get in this situation and for some reason, politicians think they can make a law and it'll change overnight. It took us 100 years to get here. It's going to take us decades to get out of it. It's not mm -hmm. going to change overnight. Um, I've heard that you are a world traveler. Um, you've been to many, many countries to help small flock growers internationally. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the important principles that you teach and maybe a few things that you've learned from international small poultry growers? That's a great question. I'm glad. Actually, this is one I was looking forward to. <laughs> no, actually, it's, it's something, and I, and I have to I have to backtrack on this one and say a little story. What the, well, I work with the Fabler Fabler program a lot, and it's it's part of the USAID's, you know, USDA AUSAID's international programming. And I knew about this from my uncle, who was one of the very first volunteers back in the '90s. And he was, he's a potato farmer in Idaho, and he would tell me about all this stuff. And I was always, oh, that is so cool. And so when I was at Arkansas working on my PhD, I had a group reach out and ask if I'd be willing to go to Kenya to work on, they kept saying layers, it ended up being breeders, which was perfect. Breeders is what I do. So it was, it worked out really well for me. And, and I jumped all over it. And it, the funny thing was, is the lady that recruited me had actually recruited my uncle 20 years earlier and didn't know we were related. So it was, it was really, to me, it was really kind of cool. Um, so what it is, is, is there's more than just farmer to farmer. There's a lot of different organizations, but they have uh, international projects where you go over and work with growers. And I've learned so much about small flock from them because it's, I don't know, I was, I was just in Timor Leste before Christmas and we ended up trying to explain nutrition to them because all they were given was corn or rice to their chickens. You know, you need some protein. You got to get them to grow. They realized they had no concept of human nutrition. Oh, we took that role of teaching how to raise chickens, you know, with new proper nutrition and pulled it over to the humans as well to try and teach them, you know, you need to improve your your nutrition as well. So it's it's more than just everywhere I've gone, it's been more than just chickens. It's actually about how to improve livelihoods of people. And disease prevention and feed are they gonna be the biggest things you're gonna deal with in any of these. You know, biosecurity is something, you know, we don't call it whatever you want. You know, we always call it keeping your flock healthy. You know, it sounds good. But again, working with them, you know, trying to figure out what diseases their challenges are. How we get to Africa, it's going to be Newcastle, Asia as well. When do they need to vaccinate? You know, how often they need to vaccinate? Things like that. It's just a fascinating thing to work with. But it's so fun to watch, to come back after you've been there and see how people have improved. And uh, if you've worked with, you, you work with students, I'm sure. So, you know, what? when you see a student get it, you know that feeling you get like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm great, you know, this. Now, that's what you get when you work with farmers in the U.S. and companies. When you start watching somebody that's taken their life and improved their life now where they're feeding their family moving forward, it's like that on steroids. I mean, it's just, I'm so I'm, I do it for selfish reasons because it makes me feel good. That, if that makes sense. No, and I really do want to help people, but I do it because I do feel good. But it's it's all about, you know, how can I hatch eggs? How can I do chicken production in a place that has no electricity, no feed industry? Uh, you know, what are you going to do? What resources do you have? What are we What are we going to be able to utilize in that area? And it's it's kind of a it's a huge problem solving thing. Uh, and there's there's opportunities all over the world to do things like this. And I, I encourage everybody to to take your education and use it to help others. Uh, there's a lot of religious organizations. There's like I said, there's the farmer to farmer. What's some of the others? Shoot, I can't even think right now, but there, there are a lot of them. If you're active in your local congregation, they probably have a mission somewhere that you can work with because we're finding that pulling agriculture production into missionary work around the world, not only you give them, you know, you're, you're teaching your religion, but you're also feeding them as well. And it's a very positive. Yeah, it sounds like a very satisfying uh, exchange of ideas for sure. It is. It's a lot of fun. And it's, yeah, sure. I think I spent 10 days last time showering out of a bucket. <laughs> but, 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 I mean, it is, I will say, if nothing else, international travel, especially to developing nations, helps you appreciate the things that you have at home. Um, it gives you a better understanding of other people's perspective in the world. It will frustrate you, though, about back home. Because I came back one trip to Kenya, or where was I? It's East Africa. I don't remember where. And I came back, I'm watching kids literally walking 
two miles each way carrying buckets of water for their home. And I'm in a I'm in a county meeting, listen to some woman complain about a farm five miles away might cause her kid asthma. And I'm like, good hell. I mean, there's no concept here of reality. And it, it's so fun to go deal with real problems rather than, I call our, a lot of our problems first world problems. They're made up. They're not, I mean, when, you, when you're worried about putting food on the table, that's a real problem. And, and dealing with those I find to be, I don't know, easier to work on because you don't have all this other stuff. I mean, how can we help these people in a way that's one, environmentally friendly? Because we, we do worry about that. Some of the projects I worked on, I was in Madagascar, we were working with farmers next to some of their remaining woodlands, trying to prevent them, give them livelihoods so they wouldn't go steal wood and stuff and do forest days. So working on projects like that, they're, they're, more than, they're more than just feeding people. They're actually how can we make their lives better and how can we protect their environment so that going forward, they still have resources. <laughs> yes, it, it's definitely mutually beneficial. And, and thinking about it from an economic perspective, I have to imagine that in a lot of those situations, it is helping perhaps marginalized groups in those communities, such as women, honestly, um, who are often the the poultry farmers in communities. Yep. And you nailed it. It is it's almost predominantly women. Mm-hmm. Who are you? I mean, you're not going to see the adult males there. That's yeah. that's a group we do not. I, I'm, so women doing this is actually very beneficial. I've encouraged a lot of my colleagues. We were doing a lot of these virtually. I pulled in, you know, like I said, I work with the county agents. I pulled them in. <laughs> and I might have played a little bit me to one. I, I got a volunteer to all do this whole thing virtually in Molly. And then I said, oh, look, I'm busy. You're going to have to do it. <laughs> she did an awesome job. Fantastic job. And, and yeah, I was in the background. I knew what was going on. But at the same time, I helped her get her stuff ready. But at the same time, it got her out of her comfort zone. She did a fantastic job. And having her there made a difference because women saw women do it. Mm, that's a good point. Having that representation is very important, especially when teaching. It's a lot easier, I think, for people to take on messages coming from someone who they feel might have a better understanding of their situation. Yeah, it, absolutely right. Very cool. It sounds like a wonderful project and definitely something uh, we should all be looking into to to help, to spread knowledge and to come back with, uh, I always come back from traveling with knowledge and perspectives from wherever I go that that influence my life positively. You're right. And and you're learning. You, and if you take time and learn the other people, and, and as I don't know, somebody said somewhere, you always leave a part of you. If you don't leave a part of you behind when you come back, you didn't love what you were doing. The- and, and I think it's important, you know, leave part of you behind when you go. Leave, you know, yeah, they're different than you. Who cares? They don't They don't have the same beliefs as you in a lot of places. So what? That doesn't mean that they're not good people. It doesn't mean they're not doing the best they can. <laughs> but I mean that about people in the U.S. too. So Yeah. 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 That's a good point. Uh, before we wrap up, there's always three questions we ask every guest related to some resources you might recommend for our audience. Uh, the first of which is, what is your favorite book or resource related to your field? Oh, related to my field? Oh, man. I don't really have one. I've read a lot of I actually, I read sounds bad. I, there's some old, the genetics of the fowl was really good. I've read some of that. That's like a 19, oh, I don't know. It's, it's early 1900s. Uh, there's some, I don't know, there's some resources, you know, the Burke's Manual on Diseases. You've got a lot of, there's really no one favorite I have. I even really enjoy looking through the standard of perfection, looking at all the different colors of the birds. I mean, so I think the most important thing there is is, is utilize what resources you have because we have a lot. There's, there's no one best for anything. I think there's a lot of really good things you can use. That's a good point. How about outside of the field of poultry? Is there any book, resource, website, podcast, something that you find personally enriching to your life that you'd like to recommend to our audience? So I read the Bible a lot. Okay, and I'm going to be honest with you. It's great. We can learn about biosecurity if we read Leviticus. You know, it talks <laughs> about it in there. And, you know, when you get to the Gospels, it talks about how to deal with people that are different than you that don't have the same beliefs and ways that are non compromised So to me, I think that's one of the best resources we have. But for me, you know, other people have different views. But to me, I, I usually try to read my Bible at least once a day, a little bit here and there to get through it. But again, that's my beliefs. Oh, others have difference. That's a great perspective. I've really never thought about it as relating to poultry like that or to, you know, interacting with other people. Well, there's there's a lot. There's actually some good stuff in there on poultry. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny because there is a lot of biosecurity. 
in, in Leviticus where they're talking about, you know, don't go around a dead animal. If you touch a dead animal, you're dirty until you go wash and clean your clothes. What is that? That sounds just like biosecurity. You went around an animal that died. Now you're dirty. You can't go around anything else to go clean up. I mean, there's some, some interesting stuff. In there. That's a good point. Uh, lastly, I'd like you to think about someone you consider to be successful. And if you could tell us a little bit about what qualities or characteristics of a person you think would make them successful, this could be in the poultry industry, in life, really in anything. Hmm. That's a, that's a side one. I didn't notice that was coming. Sorry. Deep philosophical questions on this poultry podcast. Oh boy, you're really deep. You know, I think there are a lot of different individuals I've seen that are successful in different ways. But I think those that are successful are those that are one that are confident in themselves. They're comfortable with the life they've lived. Uh, have they made mistakes? Absolutely. But they've overcome those mistakes and they've moved on and all of them are very, how to say this right, I don't want to say proud, but have very good relationship with their kids and, and they have good families. And I think, you know, if, if you're happy with what you're doing and you have a good family, what more do you really need? I like that. It's a kind of a different definition of success than we often hear. Um, a lot of people focus on material success, career success, but you know, you can't forget about the things that really matter, like being a successful member of your family. <laughs> well, you're going to go. The thing you're going to leave is your family. That's true. What, what did you leave them with? What What do they have? What kind of grounding do you give them? Are, are they successful? I mean, and by successful, it doesn't mean they're going to be financially rich, but are they happy? Are they comfortable with who they are? And are they good members of society? Hopefully I leave my family with a deep and abiding love for chickens. Right. <laughs> After I'm retired, of course. <laughs> Fried chicken, baked chicken. Oh, all of the chicken, live chicken, food chicken. <laughs> so here's my question for you then. What is your favorite way to eat eggs? Ooh, that's a good question. I think I'm a, I think I'm a poached egg person, which probably means I'm kind of a fussy person, but poached eggs on toast is probably my go-to. How about you? Not even there, brownies. Oh, <laughs> Yes, the often overlooked, probably majority of American egg consumption is in baked goods, right? Right. Come on, man. I got my cakes. I got my brownies. I got my cookies. And that's something that's so important when we educate kids. That's one thing I always ask every youth group that comes through. And it's so funny to watch them struggle. Scramble. Where did they come from? Well, there's eggs and everything. You know, your cookies and your that like that's it. <laughs> yes, I'm going to have to borrow that. That's very clever. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the Poultry Podcast Show. I really appreciated our conversation. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks, you too. Have a great day. Thanks.